Hunting Deathbed Confessions Case number 1. Russell Smirkar In 1975, 20-year-old Michael Mansfield was a student at Lincoln College in Lincoln, Illinois. He returned home to Rolling Meadows, Illinois for Christmas break, but on New Year's Eve, he received a call and told his parents he was going to meet a friend in Arlington Heights. He never returned home. Six months later, 51-year-old Ruth Martin of Lincoln, Illinois didn't show up for work. The police found blood in a bullet in her garage and her car was found abandoned in a hotel parking lot in Bloomington, Illinois. The police searched for her, but she was nowhere to be found. The disappearance of Mansfield and Martin were not initially connected, as they occurred in different cities and the victims did not know each other. On October 9, 1976, the police were called to the home of Jay and Robin Fry in Lincoln. They had been shot to death with a shotgun. Someone had forced them onto their knees and Robin was shot first in the chest. Jay was shot next as he leaned over his wife. Both were 25 years old and Robin was three months pregnant with the couple's first child. The police interviewed witnesses who heard the gunshots and spoke to Jay's sister who saw a young man leaving the house shortly after the gunshots were heard. Jay Fry was going to testify in court against 21-year-old Russell Smorkark of Juliet, Illinois for a traffic violation. Nine days after the murders, when he arrived at the courthouse, Jay's sister identified him as the man she saw leaving her brother's house. The police also realized that Jay Fry wasn't the only person who was set to testify against Smirkart that met him with an untimely death. Ruth Martin was also supposed to testi testify at the same trial, and Michael Mansfield disappeared six days before he was going to testify against Smirkart on different charges. The police arrested Smirkart for the murders of Jay and Robin Fry, and while he was in jail awaiting tra trial, he tried to arrange a hit on Jay's sister. Who was going to testify against him. His cellmate snitched on him and the hit was never carried out. Smarkar was found guilty and he was given two sentences of 100 to 300 years in prison. In October 2011, Russell Smarkar, who was 56 years old and terminally ill, confessed to investigators that he had killed Michael Mansfield but did not reveal the location of his body. He also admitted to killing Ruth Martin and burying her under Interstate 55 which was under construction at the time. Smorkar stated that he killed Martin on the day of her kidnapping and buried her that same night. However, he was unable to remember the exact location of her body. Despite the confession, the bodies of Michael Mansfield and Ruth Martin had never been found. Despite this, the police considered their murder solved. Despite not being charged with their murders, Smorkar was considered the prime suspect due to his confession. Case number two, Brian Squires. It was the evening of August 5th in 1989 and Gina had spent the night watching her brother's baseball game. After the game, she returned home with her family and left on her bike sometime between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. Headed to see her boyfriend who lived six blocks away. But when Gina did not return home by 2.30 a.m., her mother called the police in a panic, now realizing that Gina had left on her bike. The neighborhood was searched and her bike was found abandoned on the road about five blocks from her home. The last confirmed sighting of Gina was near a church, not far from where he, her bike was found. Witnesses reported seeing three men in a light green, blue or gray station wagon following her, and they pulled up beside her at the church. They tried to talk to her as she stood beside her bike, but then she got on her bike and started to ride away. A few people including her boyfriend heard screams and saw the station wagon speed off towards the highway. Sadly, no trace of Gina has been found and it scarred the small town of Frederick Town which had a population of only 4,000 people. For years, the case sat cold, but in September 1996, a man named Brian Squires was dying from cancer and AIDS-related complications in a St. Louis, Missouri hospital. In his last days, he told several nurses some horrible stories that he felt he had to get off his chest. Squires admitted that he was a driver of the station wagon that night and that he and two other men, Nathan Williams and Timothy Billow, kidnapped Gina he said that Williams slit her throat and then he and Billo disposed of the body. Squires also admitted to kidnapping nine-year-old Angie Hausman, who disappeared in November 1993 from St. Anne, a suburb of St. Louis. Squires said that he and another man kidnapped her after she got off the school bus. Squires died not long after making the confessions, but in 1999, the police charged Billo and Williams with the murder of Gina. 
Williams was also charged in the murder of 23-year-old Laura Dean Whittle, who was found dead in her apartment in 1975. Billow, who had a history of sex crimes, told the FBI that Gina's body was in a freezer and the freezer was buried on his father's 96-acre property. But the FBI searched the property and didn't find any traces of Gina. In 1999, the murder charge against Billow was dropped, and instead he was charged with lying to the FBI. He was convicted and sentenced to 30 months in prison. Both murder charge against Williams were dropped as well, and the district attorney said that they believe he is responsible for both murders, but they didn't have enough evidence to proceed with the trials. Squire's deathbed confessions were not admissible in court because he only had told the nurses and not the police. Williams is currently serving two consecutive life sentences for a separate crime. He is also the prime suspect in the disappearance of 12-year-old Tammy Surdom, which Tammy went missing from St. Charles, Missouri in 1988 and her case remains unsolved. Case number three, Journaline Kelly. The Kelly case is a chilling reminder of the dangers of domestic violence. The couple who had grown up in a rough neighborhood in Somerville, Massachusetts, married young and had two children. But the relationship was plagued by arguments and John's drinking and things came to head in 1981 at a family wedding when a brawl broke out and John's brother-in-law was killed. Fearing indictment, John moved his family away from Somerville and eventually ended up in Ventura, California, where he worked at a motel and Geraldine ran the front desk. But the couple continued to fight and in 1989, the children now 18 and 19 moved out. In early 1992, the owners of the motel noticed that John was missing. And Geraldine told them that he had been hit by a car and killed. But it wasn't until six years later when Geraldine was dying of breast cancer and confessed to her daughter that the truth about John's death was revealed. Geraldine admitted that she had killed John and that his body was in a freezer in a storage unit in Somerville. She had sealed the freezer with duct tape and shipped it across the country. Unbeknownst to the truck driver, when the police found John's mummified remains, they discovered they had been shot once in the back of the head, execution style. The bullet fired from a 38 caliber handgun was still in his skull. Geraldine's confession and the discovery of the murder weapon in her home, along with the location of John's body, were all the evidence the police needed to link her to the murder. It's a tragic end to a story that began with a young couple in love but ultimately became a tale of domestic violence and murder. Geraldine's actions were a terrible reminder of the destructive nature of domestic violence and the devastating impact it can have on families. So that's going to do it for today's stories. If you have any suggestions on what true crime story I should do next, then please leave a suggestion in the comment box. And if you like this episode and enjoy true crime and paranormal stories, then please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on my weekly uploads. Thank you.